Let's see. Take your Bible, turn to Colossians. And um, we are talking about the head, the brain. We have the mind of Christ. Man, some good, good, good things in here. I went back. I, I had showed you uh, last Sunday night. I sh I've added a lot to this, but I showed you last Sunday night where um, the Bible talks about gird up the loins of your mind. And uh, I want to tell you... I I'll show it to you. Man, it's amazing. You are made in the image of God. Amen? According to His Word, you're made in the image of God. So let's go to God in prayer tonight, asking for wisdom and blessing. May God will give us a foundation of knowledge, and that knowledge will create understanding. Then God will give us wisdom for it. All right? Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for gathering us into this place tonight. Thank you, Lord, for this this uh, beautiful fall day, the rain, Lord, and the leaves are still pretty. We thank you for that. Thank you, Lord, for keeping us all safe throughout the day. We ask you, God, Lord, that you just uh, show us in our minds and our hearts tonight uh, the wonderful way that you made us. David said that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And Father, we just thank you for that. I pray, dear God, that you would just enlighten our minds and our hearts. And Father, just show us the, the way of your word and how your word declares everything that is. And Father, as I learn about the things that you show me, Lord, about our bodies, how it relates to things in the Bible, Lord, I'm more convinced than I ever was, God, that you designed everything that is. You did it with your word. And Father, there's not an area or an issue of life where this Bible does not have the answer for our lives. So Father, Lord, open up our eyes, our hearts, give us, give us knowledge, give us understanding, give us wisdom tonight. And Father, may your name be praised and your word magnified even above your name. We thank you for this. And we ask your blessings in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Colossians chapter 1 verse 18 I'm kind of backing up just a little bit from, uh, from last Sunday night, just kind of give it the, uh, just kind of launch on forward into what we discussed last, last Sunday night. The uh, Bible says Christ, He is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that all, and in all things He might have the preeminence. Remember, the head is at the top of the body. And the typology of that is that God is over us all. God is supreme. And even this part of your brain where it comes to the cerebrum, the cerebellum, and then the, uh, the brain stem, the cerebrum represents the Most High God. It is higher and highest above all things in your body, and that represents God the Father. The, cerebra the cerebellum, it's easy for you to say, the cerebellum deals with motor functions. It is below the cerebrum, and... Where the cerebrum wants the body to go, the cerebellum causes the body to move in that area. In other words, the Most High God is fixed in His position. He sent His Son down among us to walk and to move among us. And it's the cerebellum that controls those motor functions. The brain stem communicates with the body. It communicates with the heart, communicates with the lungs especially. The brain stem... One of the most important things that it does is that it controls breathing. When you sleep at night, you still 
breathe. Thank God. You still breathe. This part of your mind has shut down. Your, your eyes, your ears, your sensations, they have all gone into a sleep state. Somebody can touch you, and you may or may not wake up. Uh, a lot of times if you wake up in the morning and you're, you're conscious that you're awake and yet for about two seconds you don't hear anything. That's because there's parts of your brain that wake up first and then later on the hearing part will wake and all of a sudden you start hearing stuff. Okay? And you're going, wow, there's a lot of noise in this room. You know, two seconds ago there was none. So anyway, the, the, uh, when, the, when the brain stem is not asleep like the rest of your brain is, the brain stem is still controlling that vital function of getting air flowing into your body. It is still in charge of those things. It's what connects with the body. That's the, that's the Holy Spirit. So anyway... Um, that the, that's, shows the Godhead, because there's three primary parts, the cerebrum, the cerebellum, and the brainstem, but these three all operate as one. First Peter 3, 8, finally be all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. And then First Corinthians chapter 2 says, but we have the mind of Christ. So as Christ is head of the body, so our mind is head of our body and it's showing forth the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we talked about the two hemispheres of your mind. How one of them is a strong side, that's the left side, controls the right side of your body. And then one part of your brain is weak, alright? And it shows, and that's the right side, it controls the left side of your body. And then we showed that the right side of your body, or the left side of your brain is logical, it, it's very analytic, it is reasonable. It is strategic, it deals with numbers, it, it deals with science, control, so on and so on. The right brain is not so. It deals with uh, feelings, intuition, uh, passions. It is where the creative side of your mind is. It draws pictures in your mind. Uh, dreams generally will come from this side of your brain and so on. Um, music, poetry things that rhyme and so on, those are all part of. So in, in, the, in the process of your mind, how you think throughout the day, the logical side deals with making the decisions. The creative side helps us make those decisions. The creative side is, I guess, sort of tries to foretell the future. You're, you're making a decision. And in the process of making that decision, you want to make the right logical decision. And the right side of your brain is creative part. It draws out pictures of what could happen if I make this certain decision. In other words, the, the right side of your brain creates this, the, the, the scenarios, draws the picture. Uh, I could run you in a little exercise. I could say, uh, everybody think of a house. And it's going to be your house. How many bedrooms does your house have, Sasha? Three bedrooms. Why not four? They put four. It's your house. It's not going to cost you anything. So four bedrooms, right? How many bathrooms? Three bathrooms, okay? What about the living room? What color is the walls of the living room? Gray. John, what color were the walls in your living room? See? Because he's a man. What color? Who had a different color in their living room? Ladies! It's always the ladies. Us guys, everything's white. Ceiling's white, walls white, everything's white. Doors are white. That's it. Just white. What colors were yours? Mulberry. Mulberry? I don't think they make a paint color called mulberry. <laughs> anyway, that's the right side of your brain drawing out all of these pictures for you. It's needed. It's like I showed you last week. You're reading the Bible. The left side of your brain is decoding the words and the language and the syntax that is on the page. But the right side of the brain is drawing a picture of what that looks like. And that's what you have in your Bible. In the Bible, you have the, the right side of the Bible, controlled by the left part, has the doctrine in it. The left side of the body, the weak side, the Old Testament, draws the pictures of the doctrine. Anytime I want a definition of something in the Bible, normally I will go to Psalms, Proverbs, Job, 
Ecclesiastes. Those books there are sort of in the middle. In the Old Testament, if I want a typology of a doctrine, I'm almost always going to go to the Old Testament. God showed me a picture of what this looks like. We have David and Goliath. That's a picture of the beast and Jesus Christ. That's that, that, sh that face off in the end. Even in the last days, we have a picture of the last days. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah. So we go back, we read about Noah, read God's description of Noah and the flood and so on. And then we are seeing the picture then of what the doctrine looks like. Now, um, and remember what I said last week. The right side of your brain being the creative side, let's say that's the wife. The logic side, let's say that's the husband. God said it's not good that the man should be alone. We can't just have all logic and reasoning. We've got to add a little color to it. So God said it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make and help meet for him. So in our decision-making processes... It's not good that the man... Guys, this is for you. It is not good that you make the decisions all alone by yourself. It's not good. It's not good. God designed it to be not good. When God wrote out the rules for, for a bishop, a pastor, he said he's to be the husband and one wife. I could not do what I do without the help of my wife. She does not make the decision. She does not write the sermon. She does not tell me from week to week, uh, I think you need to preach on this. I think you need to preach on that. I think you need... But certain things that she helps me think about, helps me see things that I don't see. It's like having two eyes. The right eye can see what some things the left eye can't see. Left eye can see some things right eye. I need both of them for depth. And that's the way it is in your mind. Alright? So, since nobody in this room has ever seen seen God. There is no memory of God and what He looks like in our minds. So God told the Israelites, since you saw no similitude of what I look like at Mount Sinai, do not create an image of me. Since we didn't see physically with our eye what God looked like, and we don't have a memory stored in our brain of God's appearance, how then could we ever have an image of God? Where would it come from? That's where the imagination is. It would come from the right side. Because the right side will draw out a picture of God. And God said no. Now, if we saw God, then both sides of the brain could work together, but we didn't. So God said, don't make an image. And that's very, very important. Because uh, remember, the, the serpent went to the woman where the desire is, where the and all that is, he went to the woman. And remember, the woman invented or created a doctrine concerning the tree of life that God never said. Now, I'm not demeaning women in any way, shape, or form. But the devil knew who to go to. He went to the weaker vessel. So that's where this idea of how to go against God's Word, it came from the imaginative side, not the logical side. Adam would have said, no. Christ, when he was tempted, said, no. Eve, when she was tempted, if you look, verse 6, when the woman saw the tree was good for food, she was drawing this up in her mind. And that it was pleasant to the eyes. And it, why is something pleasant to the eyes? How does God make fruit to begin with? When it's, does He make it all black and, and white and square and linear? and per No. He makes it circular and round and different colors. Even the bees get attracted into this. Amen? That's what the flowers, that's why they look the way they do. They're trying to draw us in. And that's how that thing was made. It's pleasant to the eyes, trees are to make one wise. She took the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also to her husband with her and did eat. Now, 1 Corinthians. Uh, let's see here. Where am I wanting to go with this? Turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Here's where, if the devil's going to attack us, 
This is how he's going to do it. Romans 1. I've got verse 21 up here, but let's go back a little bit. Verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Do we have an exact description of God's wrath for us in the Bible, or did God just leave it up to our imagination? No, he wrote down everything that he was going to do to those who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Okay? Now, my brain may be drawing a picture of hell, but I have a clear enough description in the Bible of what hell is, what it looks like. It doesn't. You know what hell looks like? It doesn't. It is a place of outer what? Darkness. You cannot see it. What does it feel like? Extremely hot. Okay? Um, So anyway, we know what the wrath of God is and what it looks like. Now verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath shewed it unto them. This one of the things about the brain to me that is cool is that you can see God in the brain. The, you know, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost. You see the three parts there. You see, and there's more to it than that. Verse 20. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. That is the left side of your brain storing the image of what God wants you to know inside of your brain because it's written out clearly in His Word. Word for word. And when you store that, it's just like, why do we memorize verses from the Bible? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So memorizing scripture, I think, is a good and vital thing for a Christian to do. You're storing that in your brain so that when you have questions, you don't have to create a God and what he looks like and how he works. You have the image of God and how He works clearly in His Word. Amen? Being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their what? What side of the brain is that? Right side. Having an imagination is one thing. Having an imagination of God that contradicts Scripture is dangerous. It's foolish. Because we don't need to dream up or imagine what God looks like. We have the image, we have the express image of Him in the form of Scripture. We don't have to imagine what heaven looks like, do we? Why not? We have an exact description of heaven and all of its beauty and glory and wonders written for us in the scripture. Now the imagination helps us as we read that. But we don't have to just imagine what heaven looks like. The reason why I'm saying that is there is a very popular contemporary Christian song called, I Can Only Imagine. You, you, had, you, had, you were lipping the words as I was saying it. it. Do you know the lyrics of that song? It's about what heaven looks like, right? And it says, I can only imagine. That's wrong. Am I being nitpicky? The way things are going now anymore? I don't think so. I don't think so. If God told you plainly what it looks like, and you reject that, and you say, well, I can only imagine what heaven looks like, I don't think so. I can read it, amen? So, they became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. The heart... Is always linked to the mind. So their mind is darkened. The way they think, these guys over on this side of the brain have been shut down. Their foolish heart was darkened. So watch this. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And here's what they did. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into a what? An image. That comes from the weak side of the brain. The imaginative side of the brain. They carve out and draw out an image of God that is not based upon memory of Scripture or knowledge of Scripture. It is based upon 
solely their imagination of what they want God to be. Let me tell you something. I am reading right now more things on artificial intelligence. And the more I read, the more I know about where artificial intelligence is going, the more I am convinced that mankind is building his own God. Because we're creating powers in computers. I never would have thought that we could do anything like this. Only in science fiction did they dream it up. But now we're seeing it in reality. I, type, I go to type things in Google and I am stunned that before I'm done typing, Google has already guessed. Let me give you a scenario. Let's say that Let's say that um, an emergency situation comes up and, um, and Sweetie Pie and I, we, we, we hear about somebody, you know, 300 miles away that needs Pastor Mike. And we find this information out and she and I are talking and I need to get to the airport and get a flight out of town and go there. And as I reach for the phone to call Uber so that I can have a car pick me up from my house to take me to the airport, as I'm reaching for my phone, I knock on the door and I go to the door and there's a guy from Uber saying, uh, yeah, I was sent here because you need a ride to the airport. That's, not, that's my imagination of what's coming in five years or less. Because artificial intelligence, how do they hear me? They heard, artificial intelligence heard my need, dispatched a car to my house. They're knocking on the door before I can even call Uber and say, uh, yeah, we were sent by the company. You need an Uber? How did you know that? I don't know. I just got this thing saying uh, you needed a car ride to the airport. By the way, I had the tickets in hand for your flight to Birmingham or wherever. Five years. Five years from now, maybe less, maybe more, but you watch and see. Because the God called artificial intelligence can do things that our brain cannot do. And it's going to predict what it is that we need and or want. Five years from now, you won't have to order groceries. They will be sent to you because they will know what you need. Not some guy in a cubicle. The computer itself will know what you need and send it to you so you don't run out. That's where we're going. That's where all of this connectivity is going. We're creating a God out of our imagination. Not out of the knowledge of this Bible. It's out of our imagination. This God is going to be the absolute wickedness of every one of us because we're making this God. Amen? And the thing is, people are going to gladly serve this God. Gladly serve this God. Willingly serve it. Uh, where was I going with this? Uh, that change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man, the birds, four-footed beasts, creeping things. And then, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And then turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 is really where the, the meat of this is. Because we are told, verse 5, let's get the gist of this. If we look in verse 3, 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 10, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. The warfare is in your mind over your mind. The battlefield is for your mind to capture your mind because from your mind, your heart and your mind are linked together. From your mind is your future. Okay? Can we control a generation of adults by capturing them as children? what 
That's what we're trying to do in homeschooling our children. We're trying to, we're trying to direct their future as adults by shaping their minds according to the Word of God. Okay? Now, I've been in Christian school. I've, I've, I've attended a Christian school. We ran a Christian school here for years. Now we have a, a, like a homeschool collective type thing. And I love it. But that's what we're trying to do is shape their future. The world knows this. The world knows it. The devil knows it. Adolf Hitler knew it. Every tyrant knows it, that if he can capture the children, he owns them as adults because of the shaping of their mind. Watch this. So, the warfare, the battle, is in our mind, and it's over. The, it's over the territory of our mind and how we think. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Can the devil build a stronghold in your mind? Yes. He cannot possess you, but he can oppress you, convince you, and do things to cause you to decide to do things in his favor rather than for God. Does that make sense to everybody? I've, I've mentioned to you people about when you decide to live right, here it comes. The devil's going to beat you. He's going to punish you. He is going to press on you. He's going to make offers to you. He's going to do everything in his power to get you to change your mind. So verse 5. We're to cast down what? Imagination. Images of God that are contrary to the Word of God. You hear people say, well, I don't think God sends people to hell. Did they read that in the Bible? No. They carved that in their imagination. In fact, I don't even believe in hell. Where did they get that from the Bible? No. They carved that in their mind. I think God loves everybody, regardless of who they are, what they do, or their... Gender expression. California now has a law or passing a law that allows for three genders. Male, female, and what was the third one, Lisa? You remember? Non-binary? Yeah, it's non-binary. Which means that you can be open and not express a specific gender if you don't want to. And that's how you can be known. And it will be illegal in California to address someone with the wrong gender expression. It'll be illegal. Don't ask me to move to California. God, please don't ask me to move to California. Okay? That's what's coming down to, that's what's coming down the road. They cast down, so we're to cast down imaginations. Now, there's imaginations that we carve in our mind, but there is also imaginations where the devil will feed our imagination with certain ideas and certain creations of how things are going to turn out or how things are going to be or how bad it's going to be if we keep serving God. He will draw in our minds how good sin is going to do for us, how good it's going to feel, how it's going to benefit us, how, our, how disobeying God... That's what he did with Eve. He put in her mind how good sin was and how she would like it and how it would turn her into an, an, an exalted being, a God, so that she could have this super knowledge of good and evil. He drew in her mind, he planted in her mind, the tempt temptation is in the mind, people. That's where we're tempted at. The battlefield is in the mind. And so he draws pictures of how, how good sin is and how, how, how beneficial it will be for us if we do these things so that we seriously contemplate them. And the imagination is a very powerful thing. Because then it seeks to control and manipulate the logic. The logic says, 
Don't do that. That's sin. That'll, that'll, that'll get you in trouble. That's what the logic says. The imagination has the ability at times to override the logic and says, go ahead and do it anyway. It feels good. It'll be worth it. Whatever, whatever you get, it'll be worth it. And who knows how many people have been plunged literally into hell because the devil was able to convince them that all the sins they can commit on this earth are going to be worth going to hell over. He lied to them. He lied. Hugh Hefner is the perfect example of that. He had it in his mind that sleeping with the thousands of women and promoting the filth that he promoted in this nation was going to was would be better than any hell that he might go to. And he went to sleep one day and woke up in hell, lifting up his his eyes in hell being in torment. Begging for water and none to be found. That's what the imagination does. We're to take that imagination, we're to cast that down. And look at, look at that verse. Every high thing. You see that? Remember what the devil said in Isaiah 14? I will be like the most high. Every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Christ says this is wrong. The imagination says, let's try it anyway. It'll be worth it. We can, it'll be fun. It'll be great. It'll be, uh, God's wrong. God, God really is withholding what kind of great thing this is going to be. He's not telling you the truth. That's what the creative imagination side does. And we're to take that down like those eunuchs tossed Jezebel down that tower, we're to take that and cast that down and say that is a lie. So let me, let me tell you where, where this thing becomes reality with me. Because I, I mentioned this morning, I, sometimes I get these thoughts. Mike, just leave. Just get out. Just go on. Just move on. Okay? It happens every now and then. And when I get that way, I know that my best remedy, I know that I'm being lied to. And I'm being lied to in my own mind. And the best remedy that I have against that is to take these two or three witnesses, just like there was two or three eunuchs that tossed Jezebel out that tower, I take the two or three witnesses of the written word of God and I read that and I make a decision in my mind. My emotions are lying to me. I don't trust them. There was a young lady that I grew up with in this church, and she got carried away into this Pentecostal tongues thing. And, and it surprised me. But she had a friend that led her into that. And I asked her point blank. I said, show me in the Bible where what you did was true and real. And she said, I can't. I can only tell you that I felt that it was good and it was right. It was in her imagination, but not in the Bible. And she said, now, I, I, my pastor can do better. I said, no, 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 I'm not talking to your pastor. I'm talking to you. I want you to show me in my Bible where what you did and what you experienced came from God. I can't. I just know that it felt real and felt right. And she let the imagination trump the knowledge of the Word of God. And that's the God that she follows now. It's sad. It really is. It's sad. God withheld that. God would not let me go there. God withheld that from me, and I thank Him every day for it. All right. So anyway, that's, that's that part. Now, watch this. You got two halves of the brain, right? Two halves of the brain. They have to, every now and then, they got to communicate. The... The left side has got to tell the right side things. And the right side has to tell the left side things. And they have to communicate. So there is this amazing, wonderful, awesome, neato thing that communicates 
The two hemispheres of the brain. That's how they talk. It's called the corpus callosum. And it looks like, like a little letter C inside of your brain. Kind of like that. Okay? There's that, you see that picture up there. We need to work together. That's the corpus callosum. It's called the great mediator. There is a mediator in your mind between the right and the left side of your brain that is working to get the two halves of your brain to get along with each other. Amen! <laughs> and it connects four things. The frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, the parietal lobe, and the occipital lobe. And I'll show you what all four of those things do. So get this. Here it is. Here it is right here. I mean, you guys all know where I'm going, right? Here's the weak side of your brain. It's the Old Testament. It's got the, all the pictures in it. Here's the strong side where God sits at the right hand. Amen. The book is there. Amen. The word is there. And here's the four books in your Bible called Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that give you the story of Jesus Christ that binds these two together. Jesus Christ is the mediator between us down here and heaven. Up. See, this book described an earthly inheritance. This book described a heavenly inheritance. And this is what makes it all possible right here. And this, you just knew it had to be that way, amen? You just had to figure, watch this. Galatians 3.20. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one. But God is one. First Timothy 2 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the Virgin Mary. Oh, that's not what it says, is it? Then why does the Catholic Church teach that? See how wrong they are? Even in your brain, there are not two mediators. In your mind, there's not a mediatrix who who takes and sells it to Jesus so that Jesus can sell it to God. That's in Catholic, in Catholic theology, that's how it works. The Virgin Mary and all of the other gods, the little gods, all the other saints, they all mediate between man and Jesus, and then Jesus mediates between them and God. But we, as the normal people, have no access to God. We must go through the priest, who then goes through the saint. Who then goes to Mary? Who then goes to Jesus? Who then goes to God? You see how warped it is? Hebrews 8, 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by which also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Take your Bible, turn to Exodus chapter 20. We have a picture of that. We, have it. we don't have to imagine what it looks like. God drew a picture of it for you. And he shows it to you. Exodus 20. You remember in... Um, in, in Exodus uh, 19, God thundered and lightning and trumpets blew and smoke on the mountain and they heard God's voice and they said, we can't, we can't take this. So Exodus 20 verse 18, and all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, how many things did they see? Thunderings, lightnings, noise of the trumpet, mountain. How many things did they see? Isn't that neat? And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. So even in the Old Testament, the Hebrew people heard the voice of God Almighty up high, on high. He's up on a mountain, right? Where's Moses? He's down here. So the people said, we cannot take God's voice. So from now on, Moses, you can speak to us, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. So here in the two hemispheres of your brain, this side says to this side, Don't, you can't speak to me. I can't, I, I can't, I can't bear it. I need a mediator, and that mediator is the corpus callosum that sits right there in the middle 
In that little, in that little gap there, in, in the two halves of your brain, there's, I, what do they, I forgot what they called that little gap there. There's like a trench. And inside that trench sits that corpus callosum that mediates between the two halves of the brain. It speaks the same language that that speaks. Whew. Romans chapter 16. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. So in the Old Testament... We had Moses. In the New Testament now, we have the preaching of Jesus Christ. We have the revelation of the mystery. It's made manifest by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. God speaking to mankind through the mediator, Jesus Christ. You see, I don't hear from God the Father. Because if I heard the voice of God, the Most High God, it would kill me. That's how big He is. That's how terrible He is. So when I say I hear from God, what I hear is from the mediator of the Scriptures. The bridge. The mediator. Now, I, I'm very careful because I'm learning not to use this idea of a bridge. How many bridges do you ever see in the Bible? Do you know you never see a bridge in the Bible? Huh? Yeah. Here's the thing. There was some, some people sent me this. There was some Sunday school literature. It was like children's literature or something like that. And it was talking about Moses and the Red Sea. And they, they said that the illustrator of this literature, this kid's literature said, pretend God is on one side of the Red Sea and you're on the other. Now, with your imagination, imagine God building a bridge across that sea so that you could get to God and that bridge is Jesus Christ. And I'm going, John, that's wrong. They're wanting my imagination to, to trump the knowledge that I have of how the Israelites actually got to the other side. It was not a bridge. It was a baptism. God opened the water and they walked through that. And yet, you see a lot of... The Christian music station in this... Joy 98 used to be called the bridge. Okay, one of, what is 102.5 or something like that, the bridge? The Christian music station. And you see churches using that name. We're the bridge, the bridge. Jesus is the bridge. I don't get, I don't think so. I, for some reason, I'm just not liking that term. Because I've seen it in New Age literature. And I don't have a perfect understanding of it yet, but I just don't like it. I just like the idea of a mediator, amen? He's the mediator between us and God. Luke 7, 22, then Jesus actually said to him, go your way and tell John what, the, I, I don't think I have this in the, oh, yeah, I do. Watch this, look at this. Go your way and tell John what things you have seen and heard. How that the blind see. How did the, how do you make the blind see? It's in the head. The occipital lobe is what deals with sight. The lame walk. That's the motor skills. The lepers were cleansed. That's the um, um, the system in your body that sends out white blood cells. And the deaf here. That also is your brain. I think I can't remember what lobe that is. The dead are raised. The poor is the gospel breach. In other words. It all works through the brain, and it works through these four regions of the brain. Okay? Now, I'm going to give you this, and then I'll, I'll just cut it off, because I've got a lot more than I've got time to deal with. Okay? But let's look very quickly at how the brain works. Okay? You have these little neurons in your brain that are called receptors. And when information travels either through the mediator or from one area of the brain to the other, let's say, let's say the, the forefront of my brain, the, uh, what lobe is that? Huh? The frontal lobe. Well, thank you very much. You guys are smarter than me. The frontal lobe is right here at your forehead. Now, the mark of the beast is in, not on. 
the forehead. Not, it's not on. It's in the forehead. That's the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is where you make all your decisions. It's where ideas of morality, decisions of morality are made in your frontal lobe. Things that are right and wrong. When you decide to do wrong, you, it's done right here. Okay? And for some reason, the mark of the beast establishes itself right in the forehead. And I think it's in the frontal lobe. I think something happens to people's minds. Their conscience is seared with a hot iron. Okay? That's all I know. But anyway, the communication process is done by way of electricity. Caleb thought it was funny because we were at this big fall festival out in Indiana and they were selling electric tasers. And every time that guy would, or that gal would hit that button, see, here's how it works. Like that, I'm just going, I don't like this. I don't like this. And Caleb thought it was funny. So we're dealing with thunder and lightning. Okay? Watch this. When God speaks... In Exodus 19, what did they hear on the mountain? It came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon a mountain and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud. There's four things here, by the way. So that all the people that, that was in the camp trembled. In Revelation 4, verse 5, and out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. There were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. The bottom line is, when the brain is communicating between the neurons from cell to cell to cell, it is doing so by electrical impulses, which are basically lightning and thunder. One part of your brain sends a command to the other part of the brain. A decision is made to take one step to the right. And so my brain just did that. It sent electrical lightnings and thunderings to the part of my brain that controls my feet to take a step forward, to take a step back, to take one step to the left. That's how that's working. God is all in this because in Psalm 77, 18, the voice of thy thunder was in the heaven. The lightnings lightened the world. The earth trembled and shook. Psalm 104, 7, at thy rebuke they fled. At the voice of thy thunder they hasted away. Now, turn to Revelation 10. Revelation 10. And I'm going to let you go. Revelation 10. I said I would never do this, and I may not. In um, Revelation 10, we have a mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, rainbow was upon his head, face as it were the sun, his feet as pillars of fire. I think that's Jesus. He has a, he has a book in his hand open. Because I think... In Revelation 5, he took the book, and in Revelation 6, he loosed the seven seals. Now the book is open. So we're in Revelation 10. He has the little book open. He set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. Now watch this. He cried with a voice as when a lion roareth. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And when he did that, when he cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now I studied this for a long time. And I said, God, what, what, what was that? Uh, like I said, Tim LaHaye wrote a commentary in the book of Revelation. He said, now the seven thunders are the seven stages of the Roman Empire. And I just went, okay, that's dumb. That's outright dumb. Where did he get that? He didn't get that from the Bible. Now, I studied thunders and lightnings in the Bible. And when God speaks, it sounds like thunder. Every time God speaks, it, that's what it, they stood there and they heard God say, this is my beloved son. And some said that it thundered. Okay? Now, I have a theory. I'm just going to throw it out to you. I'm not saying I know something more than anybody else knows. It's just a theory. Okay? When the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. This really ticked me off. Because, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And I'm going, isn't that just great? Here these seven thunders uttered a voice. Now we have no idea what they are. Not quite true. Because there's something that God said seven times in your Bible, King James Bible. You look it up. 
Okay? You look it up. Should I tell you what it is? This is my beloved son. You'll find that if you type in beloved son, you'll find it nine times. Two of those places, God didn't say it. The other seven, God did. And when he said it, some said it thundered. And in all those places, I've checked, in all those places where that's written, John didn't write any of them. Matthew, Mark, Luke, Peter. But not John. Pretty cool, isn't it? I don't know that that's it. Okay? It, I would say more than likely it's not. Because it came from me. Okay? So you just kind of roll with that. All right? But anyway, this is God talking. This is God talking to who? God. Does God talk to God? Let us make man in our image after our likeness. That's God talking to God. John 17, you have God talking to God. They communicate. How? Thunders, lightnings, and voices. Currents of electricity that are taking place. Even in the heart, the heart beats. It sounds like thunder, and it's done by electrical impulses. Okay? So that's my, that's my deal. All right, let's stand to our feet. Anybody have any questions? Jody will answer them if you do, all right? Feel free to ask Jody all the questions. Stand to our feet. God made a beautiful thing, amen? amen. Made a beauty, beautiful thing. There's a couple more things I'm going to share. I'm going to finish this up next Sunday night. And there's something that is going to end with a warning. Okay, it's going to end with a warning. Because there's something very evil and very diabolical, diabolical going on targeting people's minds, okay? Anyway, Lord bless you tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for being so good to us, for watching over us. Dear God, we thank you, Lord, for giving us the mind of Christ. Lord, everything about what's in our head, Lord, you made, and it's the perfect image of your Godhead. We thank you for that. And Lord, this knowledge that you give us, Lord, help us not be puffed up with it. But, Father, humble us, dear God, with such beauty and such order that everything about us, Lord, is written and conceived in your word. It's like our Bible's the blueprint for our, for our very existence. And again, Father, help us, dear God, to not be puffed up with our knowledge. Help us, rather, to be humble. Help us, dear God, Lord, to keep ourselves on the level of everybody else, Lord, so that we talk to each other as brethren. Talk to sinners, Lord, as, as people who care. Father, bless your word. Bless it in our hearts tonight. Thank you, Lord, for giving it to us. We pray in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. Go on, get out of here.